Shall we get started? I, I figure people can come in if they want. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Robert Muir. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Apache Lucene 4 and what it can do. Um, just to get an idea, can anyone uh, show their hands if they've used Apache Lucene before in some way, shape, or form? Okay. E either one is fine, directly or indirectly, it doesn't matter. Okay, so everyone here is pretty familiar with it, but my, my idea for this talk is to kind of give you an up-to-date understanding of what Lucene can do. And so it's pretty basic, but then it gives you an idea of what all the capabilities are and kind of how it's organized. And so that might help you to uh, make better use of its features or even hack on the code or whatever you want to do. So uh, this is my agenda. Basically, I'm, I'm going to do this overview and then uh, conclude with kind of my ideas about it. And uh, I, I have some slides for additional references. If you use the Lucene before, you probably know where these are, but just in case. And then finally, uh, at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So in, in case there's any questions about what I've discussed today. So uh, to get started, if you were to download Lucene right now, it would look like this. You would, you would see all these directories. And there's more than I've listed here, but the, the talk can only be so long. And so you might think, well, what can all these things do? And that's the idea of what this talk will address. I'm going to go through a few of these and, and tell you what they do, the basics of them, and you'll know how they tie together and, and what capabilities you have search-wise. So uh, the most important is the core library. This is probably the most used to module Lucene because you need it to do even the basic search stuff. So what we're trying to solve here is the problem where someone's doing full text search. For example, I typed in ApacheCon Denver, and what I want to get is uh, some documents coming back that are relevant to that query. In this case with Google, it's very fast, even though there's a ton of documents. And uh, not, not only is it fast, but the, the ones that come back, they, they appear to be relevant to what I'm looking for. If I want information about ApacheCon in Denver, these documents, they, they seem pretty useful. So the search engine is doing a good job. This, this is really what Lucene Core is about at, at, the, uh, at the heart of it, is being able to answer this kind of question. So let's talk a little bit more about how we can do that. How does that work? How can we search these billions of documents across the internet so fast and uh, get those results back? Well, it kind of works like an index in the back of a book, right? And, and when you go to an index in the back of a book and you want to look up a term, you kind of flip pages back and forth it's like a binary search, and you find your term, and then you've got a list of those documents. So it's, it's an inverted index, right? It's backwards. We think of documents having words, but in this case what we do is we, we invert it, and we have words pointing to a list of documents. And that, that's ultimately all the index is, and it, and it is just like this back of the book example, and I, I'm gonna utilize this in the talk, because I, I think it's a, you know, a pretty good representation of, of what Lucene is doing. So, with Lucene, this, this indexing process to, to create you know, this index, it's pretty fast, right? Lucene is, is pretty old, it's been around a while. So you can index uh, over 200 gigabytes per hour, that's with Wikipedia documents, if you have good hardware. Uh, you don't have to index all the documents at once. You can actually update existing documents or you can uh, add new documents, so that's nice. Uh, it's multi-threaded, so in your application you can use uh, th multiple threads to speed up this process. A lot of people have multiple cores on their machines, and uh, this way you can get faster indexing. Uh, beyond just the full text that we're mostly gonna discuss here, you can actually index like numbers and dates and, and binary stuff, so if you have data from like a database, you can index the, the numeric fields and, and do numeric queries like ranges and stuff like that, so it has support for that, so it's, it's more than just the Google type search. Um, but, but most importantly, you can customize how this process works. Um, Probably the most important way is to customize what is actually indexed, and that's the analysis process. Uh, another way you can customize it, you can customize what that actual index looks like and how it's represented, and that's codex, and that's like the encoding of the index. So let's dive deep a little bit into analysis. I, I think this is really like uh, the biggest, easiest way to change how, you know, the performance of your search. The quality of your results, this is the way to tweak it. Right? Because this, this determines what that index looks like and what's in that index from your documents. And that basically is key to how your search works. So for analysis, we, we have a simple goal here. We're going to take documents 
and we're going to create the index for them. So we're going to break them down into words. Um, we, we also might want to do a little bit more than just extract the words from the document. We might want to do some normalization. For example, when I search for Apache Con, and I'll, I'll go back really quick, my computer will be fast. I, I didn't actually, you know, type in the correct case. I was kind of lazy, and I just typed in lowercase. And I think, you know, a lot of people probably do this if they're, especially on a mobile phone or something. So we, we might want to, you know, still get matches even though it was, you know, capitalized differently, right? So part of that analysis process is, is doing some normalization, like removing case, like let's just lowercase everything so the case is no longer important. But we might want to do a little bit more. We might want to remove accent marks, things like that, remove plurals, right? And um, this is what analysis is geared at doing, and, it, and it's sort of a chain that, that you set up to do this. So to talk more about this chain, you, you can also think of it as like a pipeline. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to split your document into words, and that's the tokenizer, and it splits everything into words. And then what you're going to do is then modify individual words. And so you can add these token filters to your chain. For example, one might lower case, another one might remove accents, another one might remove plurals. Finally, at the end of the day, you're going to add these things together and, and you create what's called an analyzer. This is Lucene terminology, and that's just the complete chain. That's all it means. So this is how you're breaking down your documents into words so that you can search them. So this wouldn't work out very well without an example. So this is my example document. Hope there are beers at ApacheCon, right? So for the tokenizer piece, remember that's the part that splits this document into words. This is very simple. I'm going to use one in Lucene called white space, and it does the obvious thing. It just splits these words on the white space, and so I end out with these tokens. Um, now, these aren't perfect yet, right? They're not going to handle the fact that I was lazy and, and typed in lowercase when I searched and things like that, but that's what the filters are for. So the, the tokenizer's job at the end of the day is just to split the document into words. That's all it does. Um, Lucene comes with like 21 of these, and you can also write your own if you're not happy with those, but I think a lot of people are able to, to take one that's already in Lucene and they can do what they need to do. So for the filters, it gets a little bit more interesting, because I have my tokens for my tokenizer, but as we, we discussed, there's a, a few problems. I, um, one is the, this uppercase stuff, right, because I was lazy, I like to type my searches in lowercase. Uh, someone's phone might, you know, automatically capitalize every word. Generally, we don't want case to be very important, usually. So you can add a lower case filter after that tokenizer, and now we've, uh, we've changed two of the words, right? Hope and ApacheCon, these are now both in lower case. So case distinctions are removed. Uh, the other problem we might have is if I search for beer, we have a problem because this document has beers, the plural form, but I'm, I'm searching in the singular form. So we might want to do a little stemming, basically, to, to kind of get to the root form of that word and uh, in this case, I'm just using one for English that removes plurals. That's pretty much all it does. So now that we added this to our chain, we're down to beer. So at this point, we can, we can do searches, plural and uh, singular, they're, they're, you know, that distinction's removed, and uppercase and lowercase, that distinction is removed as well. So it's like a fuzzy search. Um, there's 99 of these filters in Lucene, so there's a ton. You probably don't have to write your own. You could probably use some combination of what's there, but you know, if you want to, you can also write your own. It's pretty pluggable. So uh, finally, you know, analyzer, as I mentioned before, is that it's that whole chain. So when Lucene gives you an analyzer, basically an analyzer is like a example or a demo. This is one, one I, I took one tokenizer and I took some token filters and I combined them and I said, you know, I think this is a pretty useful example, safe to use for German language or something like that. Uh, we, we provide an analyzer for each language. A lot of people, you know, they may start with that and then tweak them and, you know, make their own analyzer that, that does some additional stuff or they might remove something they don't want. Maybe, maybe uppercase and lowercase is somehow important to them. You, you can do that, right? But we, we provide them for 35 languages so as an example. So you can kind of get started pretty quickly and you don't have to uh, do a bunch of research to figure out what kind of problems you have to deal with for each language. So that's analysis and, and this is like as, as I mentioned, I think it's the uh, easiest way to customize how your search works. Um, let's talk about queries and query parser. You know, you, we talked about the index, but we didn't talk too much about how the queries worked. As, as I mentioned, to, to search for a term, you, you, you go in this index and you look up the term and you have the list of documents, just like in the back of the book. 
But you know, queries are typically a little bit more complicated than that. So let's, let's talk about what those queries might look like. Here's our index again. Again, we just have each term pointing to a list of documents. Let's uh, take a little subset of that, and let's pretend we have these two words in our index, uh, circuit and parallel, and we can think about how we would do Boolean operations on this, right? To, to, to look up one term, we just, we have its list, it's done. But we may want to do an OR query, right? And, and this is, just means you take the two terms and you, you do a union of the lists. So in this case, uh, union in these two lists, I get four, five, six, and eight. Pretty simple, so that's how an OR query works. For an AND query, it's the intersection of the lists. So both these terms, they, they share five and six, so that's how we do, do an AND query. And, and not is subtraction. So this is, this is pretty simple stuff. And you can kind of look at your back of the book index and do these queries in your head, right? Like if you, if you want to find a page in a book that's about these two terms, you could go to the back and, and sort of do this, this AND and OR. So what query parsers do is, is they give you a way to express this Boolean logic and they create these queries. They do this AND and OR stuff. And they do other types of queries too, like wildcards and whatnot. So in Lucene, we have a query parsers module. It actually has a lot of parsers, but I'm only gonna talk about two. And the two it has is uh, the classic one. This is like a strict syntax. This is the Lucene syntax that people know. Um, and in this case, I, I gave any, two examples of the way you could use it. Uh, you can use and and or, you can use things like plus and minus. It doesn't matter, it's, it's just alternative syntax. But one thing this thing will do is it's very picky, right? It, it does only exactly what you tell it, and so if your syntax is screwed up, like if you uh, drop one of those parentheses, it, it's gonna give you an exception. Uh, so sometimes, you know, when a user's typing in queries, they, they might screw the syntax up. And we, we don't wanna throw an exception, we just wanna you know, try the best we can. And so that's why we have the simple parser. It's an alternative, and it's lenient. So in this case, if I typed in the query without the closing parentheses, it will, it will execute some query. Maybe not exactly what I want, but it's gonna try its hardest to, uh, to give you good results. Finally, you know, these query parsers we provide, it's, there's no really official query language to Lucene. You can make your own query language, you can make your own parser, or you can build queries via the API. Like maybe you, you don't wanna parse any input from the user directly at all. So you have those choices. Um, highlighting. This is uh, another key feature, I think. Uh, basically, in, in, in this feature, what we want to do is we look at the results and we think, how is the user going to determine that this result is good, that I, that I want to go and look at this web page, right? We, we want to make that easy on the user. It's kind of called a relevance judgment, but what the user is going to do is they get back this list of candidate results, and they're trying to figure out which one is worth their time and which one is just you know, useless. So highlighting can help a lot there because what we're trying to do is we're giving them a little summary of the document, but we're, we're taking into account what they queried on. So in this case, I, I searched on ApacheCon in Denver and Google did a pretty good job, right? It, it took out two snippets from, from this page and it highlighted ApacheCon in Denver. And so I know that this isn't some ApacheCon, you know, from a previous year or something that's somewhere else. I know it's actually in Denver. Uh, in, in, in some cases, the, the actual snippets gave me additional information, like on the second hit, it gave me the dates of the conference. So I, I, I didn't actually search for that, but that, that helps me know that, hey, this is actually about uh, the most current Apache Con and not something that happened five years ago. So, so these summaries, based on the query, they, they help the user a lot. And, and Lucene provides a way to do this. Um, highlighter module. There's actually three different highlighters. Uh, I would recommend just start with the, the classic one, it's just called Highlighter, and you know, if you need, if you need uh, more advanced stuff, you can look at the other two and, and see what you need to do. But basically, these, these all have certain common customizations that you can use. Uh, one thing is the snippets, so that was sort of these sentences here, and, and you see Google cut off one of the sentences so it would have room for another one. It was a pretty smart thing to do. Uh, in this case, and that's because the mission statement on Apache Con is pretty long, like it, it's too long probably. So in, in this case, it was useful because I, it really helped me to see Denver highlighted as well. I, I knew that this was the Apache Con website I wanted to go to. So this process of you know, figuring out which you know, snippets of text I should pull out of the document that are most relevant to summarize it, 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 it can be kind of tricky. So you may want to customize it for your application. And, and Lucene's highlighters allow you to do that, for example, you can say, I want to split on sentences, or I, I want to use this regular expression to divide 
the document into snippets. So you have some ability there. The, the other thing it lets you do is, is actually control how you highlight the terms. In this case, we bolded the terms that matched. Uh, if this text was Chinese, that probably wouldn't work out very well. And so we might want to change the color instead. So it, it depends on your app, right, what you want to do. You may want to make it bold. You may want to apply CSS tag, you know, whatever it is you want to do. You can customize these kind of things. Uh, you can do a lot more customizations, but these are kind of the most important ones. So auto-suggest. I, I think this is a, another key feature. Everyone expects it. Google added it to their search engine, and nowadays I think you, you'd be hard-pressed to add a search engine that doesn't have this feature. The Lucene auto-suggest module, it, it's kind of weird because it also does spell checking. So it, it's just the way it's bundled. So we're talking about two features here, actually. It's auto-complete and spell check and I'm gonna discuss each one separately. So we have a screenshot of each one of these features here, and the top one is auto-suggest, right? So I didn't even type in ApacheCon Denver, and it already suggested me this query. That's, that's sort of the autocomplete functionality. The second part is when I, I typed in the query, but I really screwed it up. Like maybe I ignored all this, and I just kept typing, and I typoed everything, and so it, it gave me no results found for this typoed ApacheCon Denver, but what it did is it, it, it did a correction to that, and it figured out that what I really wanted was, you know, ApacheCon Denver. So that's, that's sort of the spell check functionality, right? These are both in that suggest folder. So let's talk about autocomplete a little bit and what Lucene can do. So it's a little bit more than just the prefix of the word. Uh, in a lot of cases, you, you want to have some customization about how this autocomplete's uh, working, and people are very picky about this because, you know, especially on a mobile phone or something like that, you, know, you want the user to enter as few characters as possible and get exactly where they want to go. So w the way we did that is we tied it into that analysis pipeline I previously talked about, and you can control how the autocomplete works via the analysis pipeline. So for example, you can remove accents if you, wanted, if you want your autocomplete to be accent insensitive. You can do lowercase, the same kind of stuff we did before. The other thing this can do is it can do typo correction, right? So um, although the user could still ignore it, and, and we'll talk about that later with the spell check, uh, oftentimes you can correct their misspelling as they're typing it, right? And just suggest them the, the, the correct query to use that will give them good results. So the fact that it can do that, you, you can get better results for the user. They don't have to spell things correctly. Uh, infix suggestions, another capability here. This is sort of like a spell, uh, an edit distance spelling correction, but it's on words, right? And in this case, in my query, I typed words in a different order or I omitted a word or whatever, we can still suggest it. And, and you'll see Google do this from time to time if you're, if you're uh, paying attention. It'll, it'll do intix suggestions. We have the ability to do payloads. And this is a little bit different. And, and an example is like Facebook, right? So if I go on Facebook and I, I search for one of my friends, it doesn't, it, it doesn't really suggest me a search, right? What it does is it suggests friends that, that match that search, and if I click on one of them, it goes directly to their page. This is really powerful, because what I've just done is I've bypassed search completely. I've just typed in part of that person's name, and it's gone directly to their Facebook page. So you can use this in Lucene by a, attaching a payload, for example, document ID, and, and your suggestions can then contain this metadata coming back that, for example, could allow the user to navigate directly to the document without having to actually run a search. So that's pretty powerful. It doesn't make sense in all cases, but it, it makes sense for structured data. Finally, um, I haven't talked about expressions yet, but you know, one question about autocomplete is how do we order what comes back, right? And um, users, you, you can use the expressions module to do this. You can basically figure out a ranking for you know, maybe I have query logs, maybe I'm suggesting from other data, but you, know, you have to decide which ones are better than others. And it, it could be just, you know, I'm selling products and the one with the most units sold should be ranked highest or something like that. It could be as simple as that or something complicated. Um, the other side of the suggest, as I mentioned, was the spell checking. And it, it, another way to look at it is did you mean? But uh, if you do suggest right, I, I think you should, if you have a search engine, you've got to have autocomplete, but users still might ignore it, right? The feedback coming back, perhaps the auto-suggest didn't do a good job, you know, perhaps it did and they ignored it. E either way, um, if they typo stuff, should you return zero results? It it's probably not very useful. So the idea of doing spelling correction is, is sort of what Google did to me back on this page, is that 
I'm not going to give them zero results. Instead, I, I'm going to try to correct it and give them at least a guess at what they meant. So uh, in Lucene, you, you have a number of ways you can basically determine how to correct this query. You can use an ingram model or edit distance similar to what the uh, suggestor is doing. You can also correct um, errors in sort of word spacing, right? And so if I search on Apache Con with a space, I, I think you know a lot of users would kind of expect that that would still find the Apache Con Denver uh, document, and it, and it does in Google. But um, we've seen has some support for that, so that you can sort of do spell checking across words, and uh, I think that's very useful. Uh, fascinating. Another, another kind of core thing that uh, most search engines these days incorporate, uh, if you're doing something more than just a very simple full text search, this is usually a good way to allow users to, to do some browsing in combination with search. So it, it can be called navigational search. Here's an example, probably not a very good one, it's Newegg, and I'm searching for CPU. And what they do is, along the side here, is break down you know, all these categories and, and price ranges and things like that and give me counts. And so what this allows me to do is, is narrow the results. And I, I do like that about their website, it's narrow your choices, because that's exactly what Fastening's doing here. I'm gonna type in a keyword, and then, and then I, I did a search, and then I'm gonna switch over to browsing for a little bit and narrow down based on the result set. So this is pretty useful, especially for, for cases like this. Um, and you have a couple capabilities in Lucene here. For one, you can have a flat hierarchy, which is sort of uh, just a field say with um, you know, category, right? So I'm just gonna have electronics, the kitchen supplies, whatever, and, and that's sort of flat. There's no nesting there. But you, you can also do like more of a proper taxonomy if you wanna do, and, and in this case, you basically have a hierarchy with uh, parent and child terms, and so you're bucketing on that hierarchy. Another thing you can do totally separate from this is you can, you can bucket on numeric ranges. So we saw this in the screenshot here where they have sort of price ranges. So I know apparently there's 691 CPU products that are between zero and $10. I guess they're really cheap CPUs. But uh, in this case, like I, I'm using these ranges and I'm, I'm getting the counts for each bucket, right? And so you can do this with Lucene as well. Sorry, I'm going backwards. Finally, um, you know, more than just a field, whereas we did a price field here, you can do sort of a formula and you, you can bucket on this formula. And an example for that might be uh, spatial distance. So we, we might want to bucket on ones that are 10, 20 kilometers away, 20, 30 kilometers away. And, and uh, that's pretty powerful because it, it can incorporate like spatial features and more complicated stuff. So since we mentioned expressions, let's uh, dive into sort of what this module can do. Expressions is a way sort of to customize the ranking it does plug into the other Lucene components, as I mentioned, faceting and auto-suggest, but you can also use it just to rank results. And so um, this is kind of my example. I'm, I, I put in our hotel and I, I searched on Google Maps for beer. And what I, you know, I, I don't really know what I want. I didn't specify exactly, uh, you know, what I need. I just said beer. I didn't say I want ones that are close by or ones that are cheap or whatever or ones that have high ratings. And, I, and you know, Google, they applied some formula here, and we don't really know what that is, but it looks like it incorporates distance, reviews, you know, how high is the place rated, and maybe the number of reviews, like popularity. And so how would you do something like this with Lucene? This is sort of what the expressions module allows you to do. So we can make up a formula. It's probably not a good one, but I, I think it will suffice for this, uh, for this demo. And um, we can show you what this would do. Behind the scenes, expressions are pretty cool. So what you do is you, you, you supply it in, in sort of a JavaScript subset. You don't have loops and variables and, and functions and things like that, but you, you can just specify, um, you can access fields, you can access the text score, you can access other functions and distance functions and things like that, and you can, and you can use mathematical operators to, to create some ranking formula. What we do is we compile it to a class just as if you had wrote a bunch of Lucene code yourself, and it, it's pretty much just as fast as that. So it's really easy to experiment with. So here, here's an experiment in this case. It's, it's a simplified version of what Google is doing. In this case, I, I have an uh, expression that's just doing distance, right? So it's just distance sort. So that's pretty useful. I, I'm ranking the documents by their distance from this hotel rather than their relevance to the query. Uh, I could try to make this more complicated and try to mimic maybe what Google is doing. We're not really sure, but so I made up a formula here. You know, I'm gonna take the average rating. This one's a 4.0. 
And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take the log of the number of ratings and divide it by distance. And so you can kind of create these complicated formulas and just plug them in to the expressions module. And you can use these not just for search, but again, you can do faceting, auto-suggest, things like that. So it could be useful if you, uh, if you wanna have uh, stuff tuned to the features you have in your documents rather than just the, the full text score. Uh, finally, you can plug into these. So I, I used a, a natural log here, but you can actually plug in your own functions, ones that maybe make sense to you, and you can also find the variable names to whatever you want. So they can go to fields, other expressions, you know, other things. So it's, it's pretty tweakable. Uh, join module. I think this one has a bad name, but uh, it is what it is. So I, I'd like to call it nested documents and I'll explain what, what, what this functionality does. There, the join module actually does more than this, but uh, I think this is the, the main core feature. So let's say I'm, I'm looking for uh, this t-shirt. I want a blue wolf shirt, extra large. Um, for a query like this, we can imagine that this, this vendor, I'm using Amazon here, but you can imagine they have products and stock keeping units, right? And the product would be the, the blue wolf shirt or the wool shirt, but the, the, the stock keeping units might tell you the color and the size, right? So I'll give an example of that. It looks like this. So here I've got my, my product, my document, it's a wool shirt, and then I've got two nested documents underneath it for the stock keeping units. So this is telling me that I have a blue shirt, extra large, and a red shirt, small. Uh, what I don't want to happen is for me to do a search on, you know, blue, small, wolf shirt, and get back this document because we, we actually don't have that. So in this case, um, you know, you have a couple of options. You could denormalize this data, you could flatten it, and basically just index stock keeping units. It, it, you know, it, that might be kind of hard to work with because then if I search on just wolf shirt, I'm gonna get back all these duplicate results, every possible size and color. And it, that might be hard on me. You know, and a better way might be to just kind of keep the structure and allow me to search on a combination of the features from the parent and the child. And that's what this join module does, is it, it kind of lets you do a join on the index between the parent and the child and search on the features across that join. So I, again, this is, is, it's called join, but it, it's sort of like a self-join from child to parent. I think it can be more intuitive if you have nested structures and that's the way you want to work with them and you don't want to do this denormalization. Um, it's a good alternative. The, the, the other approach is you can denormalize, but um, it might lead you to want to do other things at the end of the day, such as then having to like combine them back together, which we call grouping. So grouping's a little bit different. Grouping, in this case, you can think of uh, nested documents as parent-child, and grouping is like brother and sister. So what we have is we have documents, and they relate in some way, and we want to show all these documents and the results, but we want to um, combine them sort of in a, in a way that's appropriate to the user. And I'll, I'll give an example here that Google did to me when I searched for Python. You know, each one of these documents that listed here, they are independent, but they, they share one common feature, and that's they're all at the same website. They're all at python.org. And so Google sort of grouped those together. It, it didn't show me just one document. It didn't say python.org has a bunch of pages on your request. You know, it, it sort of decided that each one of these pages is its own result, but it organized them in a way that helps me navigate through the search results. And so that's how grouping differs from, from join. Anyway, so, so with grouping, we can do this kind of thing. We can, we can organize the hits into groups. So we no longer think that we have like top ranking documents, we have top ranking groups. And these groups may only have one document, but that's just the way we're, we're deciding to look at it. Uh, we can group by a field, you know, a field that we have in our index, for example, the, the domain name. Uh, we can also group by functions and expressions. So in this case, you know, we, we can decide to group our hits based on uh, some mathematical expression, right? And then that plugs back into the expressions module. Finally, um, you know, we have the question of how do we rank these groups, right? Like, like Google decided, you know, Python.org has all these, but how is this thing here and beneath Wikipedia, right? So you have to have some way to say, how should I rank the groups relative to the other groups? You know, the, the groups of Wikipedia documents versus the groups of... Uh, Python.org documents. And so it has some simple, simple choices you can, you can pick from, like sum and average across the documents that match. So that's the grouping module. Uh, memory. I think this one is, is little used, but I, I like it a lot because of uh, 
you know, it, it kind of turns things around backwards completely. So we might call it prospective search, alerts, something like that. You may have used this with Google. In this case, it's very depressing that I typed in Apache Con beer and, and got no results. But I decided that what I want to do is create an alert so that if somebody makes a document, you know, that has these words, Apache Con and beer, it's going to send me an email and it's going to tell me, hey, there's a new document about this. So we're sort of turning search around backwards. I, I'm like saving this query somewhere on Google's system, and when these new documents come in, we can think that each new document, it's running this query, and if it matches, it's gonna send me an email. That's exactly what this memory module does. So, what the memory module does is it, it sort of turns search upside down. And, what, and the way it works is very simple. When a new document comes in, it just makes an index for that one document, like our pages in the back of the book, except we've only got one page, and it's optimized for that. It makes a single document index in memory, it runs all the queries that I've registered against it, it sends out emails or whatever it's gotta do, and then it just throws away the index. So it's just this one-time thing for when a new document comes in and, and you, can, you can have this alerting feature. And it turns out it's really fast. It sounds terrible, like, hey, really I'm gonna run like potentially thousands of queries against each document this way? But it, it's so fast. I think the, the memory module, you can do something like hundreds of thousands of queries per second. So you can have many, many queries registered as alerts, and then when each new document comes in, you use this module just to, to process them all very quickly, and then you might actually add it to the index for, for later searching. Uh, codex, uh, so we, we, we talked about our back of the book index. Um, however, we didn't, we didn't talk too technical here. We're, we're still using the example that we're flipping pages and all that, and I, I wanna continue that. So here's our index, and you see we have each letter you know, we have the O and all the terms underneath O, and then we have the P, all the terms underneath P, and their document list. Well, we might want to make this a little more efficient. And here, here's a subset, right? And so I've got the O's and the P's, and I've got uh, the words in their document lists. So we might want to apply some compression, right? Uh, we can save space this way, and, and we might be able to save CPU time, too. So I'm going to do a really simple compression here, and what I'm going to do is say that for, uh, for these words, I don't need to maintain the O or the P because it's sort of redundant, right? I mean, for a back of the book index, that's not a very user-friendly thing to do, but to a computer, this doesn't, this doesn't hurt anything, right? And we just removed a bunch of redundancy. So that's an example of, of a compression you could do, in this case, to the terms, to say, let's remove some redundant information. It turns out there's a lot of ways to do this, and there's a lot of different ways that have, you know, um, pluses and minuses for different use cases, right? Like, you might look at this and say, okay, I like what you did, but really, why don't you put it in like a, a try structure or, or something like that, something more sophisticated, because these terms could share more than just that one letter, and we could compress it even better. You know, so the codex module, all, all that is is it allows you to plug in these different, you know, ideas, different algorithms, and different data structures, and you can choose as a user which backend you want to use. It, it's sort of like, uh, you see it with databases. Sometimes a database has uh, alternative backends you can choose. Same way here. So, for example, you could decide to compress things more so you have smaller amount of data on disk, but it, it might make your searches a little bit slower. Maybe that's okay to you. Uh, another example is, you know, for your use case, a different data structure might, might be really powerful. So, you might choose a codec that, that puts these terms, like I said, in a try structure rather than, than doing that simple compression that I just did. Um, the codex module, you, you can write your own codec, it's very advanced, but the main thing it has is it, it provides uh, you know, some out of the box options for different use cases. Uh, for example, uh, bloom filters, things like that. And so you can, you can like, sort of pick and choose what you want and, and customize the encoding of your index. So, again, I, I went over some of the big modules here, but we, we have a lot of other ones that I skipped. And the main reason I skipped them is only because there's not enough time to talk about all the modules in Lucene. But I do want to give an overview of what they are. So if you downloaded the source code and maybe you're looking at these slides, you know what everything is and, and what the, what's going on here. So we have a benchmark module. You can use this to, to benchmark not just performance but relevance. So there, there's, there's two different like, uh, ways you can look at the search engine, how fast the results come back and how good are the results. We have a classification module. This is sort of doing classification where I want to assign labels to documents. 
um, perhaps to using grouping or something like that. And, and this, this way basically uses the index as training data. So you've got an index of documents and they're already labeled and you can have incoming documents use the index to, to assign categories to them. We have a demo module, it's very, very simple. This is just to get you started, so if you're gonna play around with Lucene, you can go to the code in the demo module and maybe copy it and, and start editing it, and do whatever you want to do. Um, we have a, it's called miscellaneous, but it's, it's mostly tools, and, and these index tools let you do things like get, get statistics on your index, you know, split an index in half, perhaps it's gotten too big and you, you want to move it across multiple machines. You could sort an index if you want the documents to be in a certain order, things like that. We have, we have a queries module, I, and I sort of talked about and and or and not, but you know, maybe you want to do something more advanced, you want XOR, you know, if someone were to write an XOR query, we'd probably put it there, because it, it's kind of weird, like who, who needs XOR for a search, but you know, we'd still supply it in that additional module. So you can look there, there's some advanced stuff. Uh, there's a replication module, again, you know, uh, perhaps your index is too large for one machine, and so, it's, uh, it's sometimes good if you can uh, replicate it across multiple machines and balance the load. This way, uh, you know, it, you, can, you can easily scale it out to, to a higher query volume. So if you have, you know, you, your amount of users is doubling or whatever, you just replicate it to more machines and you use a load balancer to split it across those machines. We have a sandbox. This is... Um, I like to call the code Sandy if it goes in there. It just means it's not quite right. But there's some cool stuff in there you can experiment with, and that, that's all that means. We, I mentioned spatial support with the expressions to use like haversign and distance for simple points, but there is a spatial module you might use if, if you're doing things like shapes, more complicated geospatial stuff. And so you, you can take a look at that. Um, and then finally, we have a test framework. And this is just basically whenever we make uh, abstractions for our testing code, stuff that you might use, for example, if you write your own text analyzer for your own language, you, you could use this test framework to actually run a, a bunch of unit tests that we've already written that, that apply to pretty much any analyzer and, and you might find bugs in it. So this is sort of us just exposing our own uh, test work, our own test abstraction, uh, abstractions for you. So let's conclude. Um, I kind of get, did a brief, very fast overview of all the modules in Lucene 4. Um, couldn't cover all of them. It would be nice to go more into the core and everything, but I, I want to get you, an, you know, give you an idea of when you download this thing, what all this stuff's doing and what you can do with Lucene. A lot of this stuff's pretty new in Lucene 4, so a lot of these modules didn't exist, for example, in Lucene 3. And um, you may want to take a deeper look, and if you do, you can download the source code and, and use these, sort of this as a guide to navigate to where you want to go. But we also have resources uh, you know, online at lucene.apache.org. Uh, the, the Lucene in Action book, which covers Lucene 3, it's still useful. All, all those concepts still apply. It, it may not talk about some of these modules like Suggest and Codex and things that are new in Lucene 4, but the, the low-level concepts apply so you can dig deep and understand more about how the core indexing works or understand more about how analyzers work or whatever. Finally, at this conference itself, we, we have a whole conference track on Lucene, Solar, Tika. So if you want to dig deep into to other parts of it, for example, the, the distributed aspect, there's, there's plenty of talks. So um, I would encourage you to see those. Questions? Thank you very much. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question, and I will give you the microphone. Yeah, um, could you talk a little bit more about, I know about how Solar uses uh, Lucene under the hood for indexing, but you had a lot of like interactive sort of stuff with, in your demos with Google and stuff, and you know, like the big thing that Google kind of brings to the table or brought to the table, whatever, 10 years ago when it got all interactive was all the JavaScript candy that they added into the browser that, you know, that, so how do you like, you know, I don't know what the most interesting aspect of how you deploy Lucene and Solar together are, but like, I mean, how does interactivity work and like where does Lucene end and the front end that you're using to talk to Lucene, where does that begin? Because I, I could see there being a lot of like issues with like crosstalk, like how much data you're sending over your, you know, between your JavaScript and your 
And do you guys provide JavaScript utilities and stuff like that? So. Okay, I think I understand the question. Uh, for um, for Solar, you know, mostly what it does is uh, around these APIs is it, it gives you a couple things. It gives you a server that gives you an API that's not necessarily in Java, right? So you can think of using like a REST API to access these features. So, but you, you're kind of going to get the same results as if you you wrote the code with Lucene. Like for example, um, when you're doing highlighting and when, you, when you're doing search, it's going to return sort of the, the same highlighting stuff you'd use if you use Lucene directly. And, and the highlighting in, in Solar exposes all of the Lucene options just instead of you having to use a Boolean setter, you, you, you set a Boolean in configuration somewhere, right, or, or in the URL. But um, as far as, you know, the, the amount of data transfer, typically with search, like, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the, the first slide, and it's probably gonna require me to zoom out here, sorry. You know, one thing that happens here is when you search, when you do this search for Apache Gun, you see there's 177,000 results. And whether you're using Lucene or Solar or whatever, um, there's only like 10 of these that come back on page one when I do the search, right? That's all that anyone's gonna transfer across the network. So if I use Solar and I have like 10 machines, I might actually transfer a little bit more, like maybe 100 or something like that. But at the end of the day, it's still, it's sort of bounded by the number of results I'm showing on the screen and not the size of the document collection. And so I think in general, all the features are geared around that, right? We, we try to make them so they'll scale uh, to huge numbers of documents. And, and that's basically the trade-off there is that unlike a database, I'm not really gonna say, hey, I actually need all these 177,000 documents. No, I, I just really need the first 10. And if I wanna go to page two and look at the next 10, actually what happens is, you know, is they rerun the entire query and say, just give me the next 10. So across the wire, I think it's not usually a problem for these reasons. I, I mean, it gets tricky with some of the features like grouping to try to, to, try to do the uh, stuff behind the scenes if you have multiple servers, but as far as what's coming back to the user, it's usually bounded by how many results you display on the, on the screen. Does, does that answer the question? The other part of it was what's the, when you get, when, when the interactive stuff happens, how does that happen? Like, I mean, I don't know how, how advanced Solar 4 or whatever is with interactive queries, but like, you know, with the autocomplete and stuff like that, I mean, is that making a Java call every time I type a character in, it's yeah. going to a server and asking autocomplete and going back and forth? Yeah, I mean, by default, that's that's the way you do it. And, and um, I didn't talk about suggest in detail, but, you know, typically if you add autosuggest to a search engine, you can assume that it's going to take five times the query load. You know, so if, if you have, you know, say, 10 queries per second, you can assume autosuggest, you, you need to be able to support, like, 50 queries per second, right? So so one thing we do is we make autosuggest really fast, right? Um, because we assume that when you send that, that query, the user's waiting. They just type the key and they're waiting for that feedback. And if you don't give it to them fast enough, they're going to get frustrated, right? It's you probably had this happen on your phone before, and it's, you just get frustrated and you might ignore it or whatever. And if you ignore it, you know th this leads to other problems, as we discussed. Uh, you may have to then go back and correct the user spelling. Whereas if you you suggested fast enough, they might just you might guide them to the right search to begin with. Uh, but yeah, the, we're talking about. Um, very few milliseconds response time. Your problem with auto-suggest is usually gonna be the network latency and things like that, rather than something on solar we've seen. Hi, this is a great talk, thanks. Um, I hear a lot of search engines, some of the new ones coming out, talk about type ahead. And um, or type ahead search. How does that differ from auto suggest, or how does what do you suggest around setting up a search engine with type ahead? Uh, do you have to do anything special, or, or is it just increasing cache sizes? How do you go about? Any thoughts on that? Do you mean are you talking about sort of instant search where? Yeah, I think so. That's it, you, you see a lot of. Yeah, I think it's not on my slide, but let's uh, let's see. So we could do this, um, and you can do it with you know APIs in, in Lucene and Solar today. Sorry, here we go. Um, but I, you know, I think it's as simple as uh, if, if you want to operate this feature, and I think it's the way it works. I'm not certain, but I, I think it's the way it works in Google, right? Is 
you know, I'm, I'm offering this suggestion here. You can see it's already got the gray in. It's going to complete it to ApacheCon. And instead of just giving the user back this suggestion, just go ahead and search on ApacheCon too and give them those results, right? Yeah, you can just, instead of just giving them back the suggested words, instead of giving them back just this, just go ahead and, and search on that too. And they're probably not going to be annoyed if it's the wrong one because their their eyes are still up here, and so they'll just, I, I really want ApacheCon Denver, I'm just going to keep going, and I'm going to ignore the fact that all this stuff is happening on the bottom of my screen. So I, I kind of think that's how it works. I'm sure it's more complicated with Google, but um, but that's how you could do it, right? Thank you. Uh, I was wondering when it comes to certain functionalities, let's say the field types. Like I know uh, Solar has added additional field types, like data, uh, date types. Right. Uh, how did it happen that like I would think it more belongs to the Lucene level rather than Solar level? Like these sort of things, uh, uh, like that's one example of it. Uh, when we trying to find out where to look for these things, is it at the Lucene level versus solar level. Uh, okay. How, how, and the other thing is logging, for example. Like uh, people running the queries, you want to also ca somehow capture the log somewhere to use it. Okay, well, these, these are two separate questions. For the, for the first one, like the field types, uh, if you go and look at the solar code, you'll see that, for example, for the date field, that it, it uses the, the numeric range type fields that are in Lucene. I, I, I talked about briefly that you know, for these, for these numbers and things like that, you can index them in a little bit different way so that you can do more numeric type operations on them. Well, the, the, the solar field types actually using the, the Lucene numeric types behind the scenes. So, you know, if you, if you go and look at the solar field types, you can, you can see immediately where they plug in, like at the low level, they just use the Lucene stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's not always that way, but in general, I, I think that's how it tends to work. It's that you've got, you know, for Lucene, we, we just have the field type, and, and in Solar, you have sort of a way to configure that without writing Java code, a way to use it, and things like that. Um, on the logging, on the other hand, this is different. Like, Lucene doesn't, doesn't use logging. We sort of leave that to the application. So if something goes wrong in Lucene, we, we give you an exception or whatnot. It, it's a Java API. So, so, for example, logging in Solar is purely within sort of Solar's domain because it's an application, and logging makes sense there. But for an API, you know, if something goes bad, I may not want to log it. I, I may want to, you know, throw an error. I, I may want to, you know, turn off the nuclear reactor or whatever I've got to do to deal with that error. So we leave that to the app in Lucene. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much.